myocardial infarction. High plasma or homocysteine levels and, uh, and uh, smoking and alcohol are other factors that uh, predispose people to acute myocardial infarction. Not that I have put smoking and alcohol at the bottom, but a majority of texts that we read these days, smoking and alcohol are ranked as the first they belong to. Uh, they are higher than even that in uh, predisposing individuals to acute myocardial infarction. Now, how do we diagnose uh, acute coronary syndrome? Historically, acute coronary or coronary artery disease assessment has been mainly binary using WHO criteria of symptoms, electrocardiography, and biochemical markers. Yeah, but this uh, binary means we have to use any two of these, okay? If we have symptoms and electrocardiograph, electrocardiographic changes, we are able to diagnose acute myocardial infarction. If you have symptoms and biochemical changes, we are able to diagnose acute myocardial infarction. The, so the creatine kinase isozyme CKMB has been the benchmark for markers, but it is not specific, in fact, for the myocardium. <coughs> CKMB can be found in other tissues, okay? Although it has been the gold standard for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, it is not uh, specific. The more specific ones are the cardiac troponins, which we'll talk about later. So, for the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, we have to use these three criteria that are there. We have clinical picture, we have electrocardiographic changes, we have ele elevated biomarkers, and the diagnosis requires any or any of any two of these. Clinical feature of severe prolonged chest pain, constrictive and radiating to the shoulder or neck will give a suspicion of acute myocardial infarction. The individual was previously well, and the pain has this onset on the left chest, okay, the left-sided chest pain, with, uh, which is severe, constrictive, and radiating to the shoulder or the neck, is suggestive of acute myocardial infarction. Once this is realized, then doing an ECG will corroborate the information. So if an ECG, which has got an elevated ST segment, this would be diagnostic of acute myocardial infarction. So severe left sided chest pain with elevated ST segment is of diagnostic value in acute myocardial infarction. In fact, up to the 50s, this was the only way in which uh, acute myocardial infarction was diagnosed. After the 50s, there we brought on board cardiac biomarkers. So biomarkers now are used as an additional or a refinement of a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. But if we have a severe chest pain, normal ECG changes, but elevated biomarkers, we make a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. So we can use any one, any two of these uh, criteria to make a diagnosis. What is a biomarker? It's a substance used in as I mean an indicator of a biologic state. It is a characteristic that is objectively measured and, and evaluated as an indicator of normal or abnormal process. Normal biologic process or abnormal biologic process, okay? If it's elevated, it means it's abnormal, and if it's in normal ranges, it means that process is normal, okay? So that is the, the biomarker, okay? Cardiac biomarkers are substances that are released from the heart when the heart muscle is damaged, and is damaged due to inflammation, ischemia, or necrosis. And there are quite a number of them, okay? We have those which are pre pro-inflammatory, and the pro-inflammatory biomarkers do not really say acute myocardial infarction, but they tell they tell you that the myocardium is it's, it's going towards the infarction. Okay, CRP and uh, lipoprotein phospholipase A2 and homocysteine are these biomarkers. If these are elevated in circulation, we must 
uh, check whether the heart is not being disturbed. Plaque rupture, and plaque rupture is uh, related to uh, an atherosclerotic plaque, which commonly forms in uh, elderly people within the, uh, in the intimal side of the blood vessel. It's a swelling that is lipid laden within the uh, within the intimal side of the blood vessel. It causes obstruction, and when it is ruptured, it the clot that's formed there may cause an obstruction. So any time the clot, the plaque ruptures, these substances are released into circulation, and they can be measured. So the pro-inflammation. And the second one is when a plaque is ruptured. And when a plaque is ruptured, we have the substances that we can measure in circulation include soluble CD40 ligand plus central growth factor or pregnancy-associated plasma protein. These are substances that are released when a plaque is ruptured. And we can be able to assay them in circulation. And if we find them, we know that we are tending towards a myocardial infection. Ischemia, ischemia is a common cause of, of myocardial infarction or myocardial uh, cell death. And uh, ischemia can also be assayed before we get to the actual myocardial infarction. And we measure or we assay for ischemia using a free fatty acids or unbound free fatty acids. And uh, we also have albumin, which has been ischemia modified. Now, today, our main talk will be going to be on the, the biomarkers we use for cardiac necrosis or cardiac cell necrosis. And they include cardiac enzymes and AST, LDH, and CK are those that enable the myocardium to utilize energy. CK, MB, uh, myoglobin, and troponins are other, yeah, sorry, CK, MB is also an enzyme which enables myocardium to use, utilize energy. Myoglobin and troponins are used for myocardial cell contraction. Then the last one will be myocardial stress, uh, uh, stress mark markers, which are usually the nitritic peptides. And we have two nitritic peptides. We have atrial nitritic peptides and the B-type nitritic peptide. Okay. Now, of these cardiac biomarkers, Today, we are going to concentrate mainly on the ones that, course, that are measured in necrosis. Okay? Now, cardiac biomarkers or cardiac markers must be, they must be located in the myocardium and they must be released in acute myocardial injury. And this causes, the causes of injury include myocardial infarction, non-Q-wave infarction, and stable angina pectoris. And there are numerous other conditions that may cause the cardiac biomarkers to be released. And they include trauma, cardiac surgery, and myocarditis. Myocarditis is an inflammatory process of the myocardium. Okay? And these biomarkers or these cardiac markers can be measured in blood samples. Okay? So the cardiac biomarkers can be measured in blood samples following these events. The characteristics of these biomarkers are such that they are that they should be highly sensitive. That means that high concentrations are realized in circulation as following an acute myocardial injury. Okay. They should be released. So sorry, those that indicate early myocardial infarction should have should pour very rapidly in circulation. And those that can be used for measuring uh, a delayed or a retrograde, uh, a, retro a retrospective cardiac in myocardial cell infarction should have a long half-life. In other words, it should be in the blood for longer than a few days before we can measure them for a key assessment of myocardial infarction. So space sensitivity simply means that we are able to find it when there is a myocardial cell event. Okay, So it should be in blood when we have a myocardial cell tissue injury. Specificity means that when there is no myocardial cell injury, then this uh, biomarker is not assayed or assess accessible in circulation. 
and that it is not detected in, in those people who do not have acute myocardial infraction. So specific has it has to have high sensitivity present any when there is damage and it must be uh, specific, meaning present only when there is myocardial cell injury. It can also, it has also got to have uh, easy accessibility. We must be able to measure it with a cost effective method. Uh, should the, this cost effective method must be simple, simple to perform and have a rapid turnover, turnaround time. Meaning we should have a simple method that we can easily perform and we get the results very rapidly. Okay, and uh, clinically, this uh, uh, biomarkers should enable us or should influence our mode of management. They should help us in managing the patient. If we can use them for assessing the severity and assessing the prognosis of the uh, of the uh, of the patient. Okay, so high specific high sensitivity, high specificity having a good color analytical characteristics and having clinical implications so this is the these are the characteristics of these biomarkers that we need before we can utilize them for diagnosis are we together hello yes look are we together can you hear me Yes, Doctor. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good, good, good. Sometimes I lose my electricity before my network before I realize I'm talking to myself. Now, the myocardium, the myocardium itself contains bundles of striated muscle fibers, and the activity of the myocardium is to pump. So this pumping activity is done by contraction and relaxation of these striated muscle fibers, okay? Their fibers contain within them uh, specific cardiac proteins. And these specific cardiac proteins are actin and myosin. And then around these uh, uh, proteins are also regulatory proteins. And the regulatory proteins are troponins. And the enzymes that uh, confer energy include, sorry, and the proteins that confer energy Enzymes and proteins that confer energy, like myoglobin, creatine kinase, AST, and lactic dehydrogenase. So in the environment of the myocardial cell, we have uh, striated muscle fibers. We have uh, 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 regulatory proteins like actin and myosin. So the specific cardiac proteins, we have regulatory proteins like troponins, and we have the energy transfer proteins like the enzymes okay so this is what we get in the myocardial environment so the cell has got this kind of uh, <coughs> configuration and i'm giving i've given you just a few examples of those uh, uh, biomarkers that i have listed on the other side <coughs> this is just to show you which ones will come out first like we see in this the diagram here we have myoglobin which are just distributed within the cytosol. We have CKMB, which is bound to the organelles, and we have the troponins, which are locked within the contractile uh, filaments, uh, uh, sorry, the contracted elements. Now, when we get a rupture of this cell here, the first protein to leak out here will be myoglobin. It will take a little while for CKMB to come out, and it will take a lot longer troponin come out because we have to unwind a lot of membranes in order to release the troponin so the size and subcellular distribution of myocardial proteins determine the time course of their appearance in circulation okay so where they are and where and uh, where they are they are held on where they are located uh determines when they appear in circulation so this diagram is just to illustrate to you how that the the myocardial cell biomarkers uh, uh, leak into circulation. Now the cardiac biomarkers are numerous. On my uh, left, so right hand side, I have cardiac enzymes, 
and cardiac enzymes are really of historical uh, significance. These were the earliest, uh, the earliest biomarkers that were uh, utilized for acute myocardial infarction. We have now come to the cardiac proteins, which are now the gold standard for diagnosis or so diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. But the progression to this has been using the cardiac enzyme. We have AST activity. We have lactate dehydrogenase enzymes. So uh, we have uh, creatine kinase enzymes, and we have glycogen phosphorylase (BB). So these are the historical biomarkers, and they are the ones that have led us to the cardiac proteins, which are troponins, myoglobin. And as we go down, we notice that ischemia-modified albumin uh, and uh, fatty acid-binding proteins are really not biomarkers that are located within the myocardium, but they are biomarkers that enable us to assess ischemia. Okay, Highly sensitive C-reactive protein is a measure or is a measure of any inflammatory process and it is used for it can also be used to assess cardiac inflammatory processes okay now we are going to talk about these biomarkers individually and see there where they fall in their diagnostic significance we start with aspartate amino trans Aminase, aspartate amino transaminase is an enzyme that enables you to utilize aspartate as a source of energy. The enzyme deaminates aspartate and enables you to generate oxaloacetate, which is an intermediate in a Krebs cycle. So once we enter, once the OAA enters Krebs cycle, we can now generate energy from aspartate that it's used by all cells, okay? It is all over, it is within the, every cell of the body that uses energy, okay? But it is more, uh, more commonly found in the heart and also in the, in the liver, okay? So it's normal activity within circulation is six to 25 international units. It, this activity increases within six to 12 hours after a chest pain, okay? So in acute myocardial infarction, this enzyme elevates and it elevates within six to 12 hours and peaks within 24 to 48 hours, okay? Here, I've paid a less specific indication for acute myocardial infarction, and I think we can take this, uh, 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 this statement very lightly, because any time an individual has a left-sided chest pain, the, the fact, the, the chances that the liver would be on the left side of the chest uh, is very little, okay? So anytime we have a left-sided chest pain, AST elevation is more specific for the myocardial cell damage, okay? So myocardial, so AST is elevated mainly when there is myocardial ischemia, or it can also be elevated in uh, congestive heart failure, okay? And it, it, it is also increased, uh, it's increased as SUT. Its increase is less than that of CK, creatine phosphokinase, and creatine phosphokinase we are going to see slightly later, okay? This enzyme turns to, return to normal within four to six days. So in acute myocardial infarction, it elevates within six to 12 hours, uh, peaks within 24 to 48 hours, and it remains in circulation for four to six days. In other words, it can be used to diagnose uh, a late karma of, a, on, of acute myocardial infarction. So somebody who comes, say, five days after the onset of a left-sided chest pain, uh, this CKMV, sorry, AST can still be used to diagnose acute myocardial infarction in them, okay? So, so that AST. The next one is lactate dehydrogenase. This is an enzyme whose, which, which uh, catalyzes transfer of, uh, sorry, triasure, uh, it's, no, sorry, is a, a hydrogen transfer enzyme that catalyzes the reversible conversion of lactate to pyruvate and vice versa. So you can, uh, this enzyme can allow you to use pyruvate as a source of energy or to use lactate 
to convert lactate to pyruvate so that we can be able to generate energy. It is an energy generating uh, enzyme. The enzyme is a tetramer composed of two different types of subunits. Different subunit combinations result in five structurally different lactate uh, dehydrogenase iso isozymes that are present in all cells in the body. So LDH has five isozymes and they all have the same function but in different sites of the body. So different tissues have different isozyme composition. Okay. The lactate dehydrogenase 1 isozyme is the one found predominantly in the heart muscle. Lactate dehydrogenase 2 is found primarily in the reticuloendothelial system and in circulation. LDH3 subunit predominate in the lungs, LDH4 in the kidneys, and LDH5 is in the liver and skeletal muscle. So we notice that for our uh, diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, the only relevant uh, isozymes would be LDH1 and LDH2. So we are going to concentrate on those from here now. Okay. Usually, the amount of LDH2 in blood is higher than that of LDH1. So patients with acute uh, myocardial infarction have more LDH1 than LDH2, and this means a ratio of greater than 1. Okay, This is a flipped ratio. Okay, So if we have, now take the first scenario, we have the amount of LDH1 is less than LDH2, so the ratio is less than one. Okay, when a kid myocardial infarction, LDH2, LDH1 is greater than LDH2, so the ratio is greater than one. So the ratio is flipped. It's from less to less than to more than. Okay, so an elevation, uh, an elevated level of LDH1 with its flipped ratio has a sensitivity and specificity of approximately 70 percent and 90% respectively for detection of acute myocardial infarction. We can see that LDH is a good biomarker that can be used to make a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, okay? So those, both of them may increase in circulation, okay? But we have uh, assays that identify just LDH1 and LDH2, okay? So we can use them to say uh, the LDH1 in circulation. And it is usually, uh, sorry, in acute myocardial infarction, LDH1 is elevated within 10 to 12 hours after acute myocardial infarction and peak within two days and remain in circulation for seven to 14 days. If you remember that the, <coughs> that AST is elevated at six to 10 hours, six to eight hours, this one here comes a little later. So patients with acute myocardial infarction who come to you less than 10 hours after uh, the onset of pain, you are very unlikely to use LDH to make a diagnosis. But after 10 hours, you are fairly likely to make a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction using this, uh, uh, this enzyme. Note that this enzyme can also be used way up to two weeks for diagnosis of a previous myocardial infarction. So it is one that can uh, comes late and also can be used to uh, diagnose a late coma in acute myocardial infarction. Now, CKMB, CK, are we still together? Oh, yes, we are. CKMB is a, a nisozyme of... Uh, creatine phosphokinase. Creatine phosphokinase is a ubiquitous enzyme. Its function is to phosphorylate creatinine, uh, creatinine, and when we phosphorylate creatinine, we create a high energy compound. These high energy compounds are found in uh, places where muscular contraction is uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, prominent. So CKM, CK, Creatine, uh, sorry, creatine phosphate is uh, a high energy compound that can be utilized to generate to give energy in all contractile units. So CK is ubiquitous. It is in all cellular tissues, including all the
the muscle striated and non striated muscles. Okay, but CK CKMB is an isozyme that is found within the myocardium. Okay, it is found within other cellular tissues, but it is in higher concentration within the myocardium. Okay, CK serum serum CKMB is elevated within two to eight hours of acute myocardial infarction. So this is an early, on early marker for acute myocardial infarction. So a person who comes in three hours after acute myocardial infarction, or over, sorry, of acute left-sided chest pain, this is the one that is of diagnostic value, okay? This was a gold standard up till about 2004 when the troponins took over. It was a gold standard for acute myocardial infarction. In fact, it is still used for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, even at the, at the present time, in conjunction with troponins and electrocardiographic changes. Okay? CKMB values return to normal within two to three days. So that means that after the after three days of uh, acute left chest uh, left uh, sided chest pain, uh, the third the fourth day, if you create uh, sorry uh, CKMB, it's not of diagnostic value. So you can only use it within the first three days of acute myocardial infarction. After that, it is no longer useful to you. But note that it may be of prognostic or diagnostic uh, 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 value if it, is, it spikes again on the fourth day in a patient whom you are managing. If it spikes again, it means there is another ischemic episode or another acute myocardial infarction that has occurred. Okay, it is more specific than a creatine phosphokinase. A creatine phosphokinase is generalized, while uh, CKMB is localized. But we can also compare it to creatine kinase, and we can use this thing called the uh, MB index. And the MB index is the creatine cascade, uh, creatine kinase MB divided by creatine kinase divided multiplied by hundred. Okay. This you can be used so that we can confirm or rule out uh, skeletal muscular injury. So if we can, we use the level of CKMB with the index, we can be able to diagnose acute myocardial uh, infarction with, with certainty, okay? So it makes it more specific for acute myocardial infarction. Now, this one, you're not going to find many places where you use this enzyme for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. This protein, uh, this is a, a phosphorylase. This phosphorylase also enables you to utilize uh, glucose, particularly from glycogen. So glycogen phosphorylase is an enzyme that is an isozyme of glycogen phosphorylase. Okay, this acid is found in the heart and in the brain tissue. The enzyme is one of the new cardiac biomarkers. Now this is the one that is going to be discussed in improved, uh, in, in, in revised or in more improved uh, uh, diagnostic uh, approach to acute myocardial infarction. It rises rapidly in circulation. So the levels are seen within the myocardium uh, sorry, within the uh, circulation in acute myocardial infarction and in unstable angina. There's a rapid rise of this enzyme in circulation. This enzyme is a very small protein and it leaks out even when the myocardial cell is not completely uh, broken down. So ischemia uh, re re releases it from where it is bound and it, it leaks out in circulation. This is a very early marker in acute myocardial infarction. Glycogen uh, uh, phosphorylase BB isozyme is a you know, in the myocardium is predominantly tissue bound. So it is bound to the organelles within the myocardium. So with the onset of tissue hypoxia or ischemia, when glycogen is, is broken down, the glycogen phosphorylase is converted to uh, structurally uh, bound, sorry, from structurally bound to cytoplasmic form. So it is released from the organelles and by the onset of hypoxia or ischemia. It's 
it is it leaks out and it increases in circulation between the first to four, the one to four hours after the onset of left-sided chest pain okay so it rises before ckmb or the troponins that we we are going to see okay yeah it is not cardiac specific as ck sorry as uh, bb is mainly a brain uh brain uh, uh, protein interestingly the blood brain barrier has got very little uh, prevention of this phosphorylase from leaking into circulation so this is a small protein it may through, leak through the blood brain barrier and be found in circulation when there is ischemia in the brain not in the in the myocardium but anybody who has a left-sided chest pain and presents with an increased glycogen phosphorylase BB, I must have acute myocardial infarction because where it leaks from is the myocardium. Now we come to what is now standardly known as the gold standard for, three, for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. So these have taken over from CKMB and their cardiac troponins. Cardiac troponins consist of three subunits of troponin. These three subunits are C, I, and T. C for uh, calcium binding, uh, I for inhibitory, and uh, T for, uh, for contraction. So the T, troponin I and troponin T work together in the myocardium, in the myocardial cell, and they regulate myocardial cell contraction okay the t uh, allows contraction while i inhibits contraction the c binds to the calcium and calcium is used in every tissue in the body so the uh, calcium binding troponin is found in almost every tissue in the body so it may be not be of real biological marker for acute marker infarction so the complex regulates contraction of striated muscles okay the troponin t as i've said binds to calcium and this is everywhere in the body so we can't be able to use it as a, a diagnostic marker so the troponin i binds to actin and inhibits actin myosin uh, interaction in other words it causes muscular relax relaxation the troponin t binds to tropomycin attaching it to the thin filament and this causes contraction so T and I work together to cause, to regulate contraction. One, relaxation. The other one, contraction. So the cardiac troponin I is a, a very small protein. It's low molecular weight. And the human one, the human type has an additional amino acid residue at its end terminus. And this does not exist in the skeletal one. So it is easy to identify this using this marker. So it is a, a marker which has got an, a typical mark on it to identify it. Okay. So this marking, making the C, the troponin I, is specific marker for the myocardial cell. The troponin, the cardiac troponin I, is released uh, rapidly into circulation after the onset of acute myocardial infarction okay, so here so serum increase is found between two to eight hours and returns to normal within seven to 14 days now two to eight hours and like all other proteins it peaks within 24 to 48 hours okay and this now it looks like uh lactate dehydrogenase okay although lactate dehydrogenase the onset is 10 10 to 12 hours of acute myocardial infarction, but the period on along which you can measure lactate to dehydrogenase is within 10, within the first day to the 14th day. So the troponins, uh, the troponins only get it, uh, uh, sorry, only are better than the uh, lactate dehydrogenase in that they can be used before the 10th hour of acute myocardial infarction. Yeah, it release pattern is similar to that of CKMB, but CKMB is, uh, CKMB, I said, was, was four to six hours after the onset of acute myocardial infarction. 
So four to six hours is within two to eight hours. So CKMB and uh, troponin can be used similarly. So cardiac troponin I uh, levels are useful for prognostic information. So the higher the amount, the more uh, the damage to the myocardium. Okay, so they are able to tell you how much myocardial cell tissue have been damaged. And usually the reference range is less than two nano, nanograms per mil. Cardiac troponin T is the next one. It is, this is present in uh, uh, fetal skeletal muscle, okay? Cardiac troponin T is present in fetal skeletal muscle. And it means it is absent in the adult skeletal muscle. It is of diagnostic value just for myocardial cells. But the nasty thing about this is that when there is muscular, skeletal muscular injury, this, uh, the, the gene for this, um, this troponin T can make it regenerate, can regenerate so that troponin T can be expressed in injured uh, skeletal muscle. Okay, so this may confound the uh, diagnosis. But without any injury to the skeletal muscle, troponin T is still cardiac specific. Okay, it's biologic half life and uh, serum uh, increases of troponin T are similar to those of troponin I. The only difference is that it peaks, its peak varies. Okay, it varies between 12 to 96 hours. So it has a very long peaking time. It can peak at 24 hours, at 36 hours, and so on, while the troponin I peaks within 24 to 48 hours, like all the other proteins, okay? But it has got the same pattern as uh, troponin I and uh, lactate dehydrogenase, in that it returns back to normal within 14 days, okay? So those are troponins, and the troponins are now the ones that we use for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. Now we have assays that uh, enable us to uh, use the troponins at, uh, at emergency uh, levels. So high sensitivity uh, cardiac troponin uh, assays, they expedite the evaluation of patients with possible acute coronary syndromes in the emergency room. So these are assays that we can use to identify persons who otherwise don't have symptoms that are over, over acute myocardial infarction, but are likely to have, uh, have predisposing factors that may make them have a myocardial infarction. An old man who is hypertensive or who has a diabetes and comes in for another condition may have an imminent acute myocardial infarction and this high sensitive cardiac troponin is one that we use for such individual. Individuals who don't have typical uh, presentation for acute myocardial infarction, but are predisposed to having acute myocardial infarction. So rapid screening protocols with uh, high sensitivity cardiac troponin have been proposed for patients for whom ruling in or ruling out acute myocardial infarction is of primary use. And I've given you those, that an example of that patient, an elderly person who has hypertension or diabetes, who comes in for another condition, say for a, an evaluation of a urinary problem. Yeah, they may be having a predisposition to acute myocardial infarction. And this is a screening tests that can be used. An elevation of troponin T on this high sensitivity cardiac uh, uh, troponin uh, indicates the heart muscle damage or heart attack. So in these people, we can be able to make a diagnosis of heart, whatever. So the high sensitivity uh, cardiac troponin test can detect very uh, small levels of troponin in the bloodstream. Okay, these are currently preferred troponin assays to differentiate them from the contemporary assays. We have contemporary assays that are used traditionally for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. Okay, they have a precise definition of normal. 
that normal for this uh, uh, troponin assay is the 99th percentile. And 99th percentile is the upper limit of the, of the uh, sorry, it's towards the, uh, the upper limit of the, uh, uh, the range for normal cardiac troponin. And we, and we noted that the upper limit was two. So the 99th percentile is just slightly less than two. Okay, and a total precision must be less than, uh, sorry, to in precision must be less than 10%. Then in other words, it must be 99, sorry, 90% precise on this 99th percentile uh, troponin. Okay, 99th percentile troponin is the troponin level uh, just slightly above, I uh, said below the upper limit of the, uh, normal range. We're still together? Uh, yes, we can hear you yet. All right. Now we get to other things that we do. We have finished with the, uh, the biomarkers for acute myocardial infarction. We are now just beating about the bush. So we are doing things that uh, we can do when we have uh, leisure time. Okay. So the myoglobin is a, a, an oxygen carrying a protein, okay? It's a heme protein that carries oxygen and is found in all contractile, skeletal, and non-skeletal muscles, okay? It is a low molecular weight protein. Its function is to transport oxygen to enable muscular contraction, okay? It can be quantitated by a rapid immunoassay, okay? And skeletal and cardiac are really identical. So when the serum, so the, when we have a myocardial infarction, this it, leakage into circulation is uh, uh, within the first two hours. So serum levels are elevated within the two hours of muscular damage. This is either skeletal or uh, cardiac. Okay, but if we have right left-sided chest pain. The, like, the likelihood that this is a myocardial cell is high, okay? This, uh, the myoglobin peaks within six to nine hours and returns to normal within 24 to 36 hours. It is an excellent negative predictor of myocardial cell injury. So this predictor, we have to measure how to use this predictor. We use, so we can measure its uh, level at two hours, okay? And then wait for another two hours to measure another uh, level. So if the level at two hours is not increased within the next two hours, you know, so in other words, two are two samples, one at two and the other at four, and there is no change, then there is no myocardial infarction, okay? So when there is no myocardial infarction, the myoglobin level does not change if you identify these patients early, okay? Now, uh, this I uh, told you, now we are beating about the bush. Uh, this is a measure of ischemia. Ischemia modified albumin is really a measure of ischemia. So serum albumin is altered by free radicals released from ischemic tissue. And ischemic tissue can be anywhere in the body. We know that the albumin is the ubiquitous protein in the body. So ischemia can modify it anywhere, okay? Uh, ischemia modified albumin uh, rises uh, rapidly and it remains elevated within two to four hours and return to baseline within six hours. And this may detect reversible myocardial ischemia. So anytime we measure ischemia, we are trying to protect uh, the liver, so, sorry, the, the, the heart. So anytime we identify ischemia, we can go against ischemic processes. So we can improve or remove the ischemia so that there's no tissue damage. So ischemia modified albumin allows us to detect the degree of ischemia and know that the heart is maybe exposed to acute myocardial infarction and be uh, able to do manage this myocardial, sorry, systemic ischemia before we, um, before we uh, make a, a myocardial infarction. Unfortunately, this uh, Ischemia modified albumin is non specific because it is elevated in a stroke or in some other uh, conditions like neoplasms, 
hepatic cirrhosis, and end-stage renal diseases. So these are the things that cause generalized ischemia other than myocardial infarction. The last one is uh, these are proteins that respond to stress in the myocardium. So the heart secretes natriuretic peptides to maintain stable blood pressure, uh, plasma volume, and prevent excess salt and water retention. There are two types of uh, atrial natriuretic peptides. We have the atrial natriuretic peptide. This is the initial one, uh, the one which was a uh, Sorry, there are two types of nitritic peptides. We have atrial nitritic peptide and B-type uh, atrial BP-type nitritic peptides. Okay, the atrial nitritic peptide initially was identified in atria of uh, of rats, and then the B-type was uh, identified in pig brains. Okay, this is where they were initially identified. Now we know that. Uh, atrial nitritic peptides are within the myocardial uh, cells. And any time we have an elevation in fluid volume, uh, atrial nitritic peptides increase in circulation. Okay? The B type means it is a brain type, and the brain type, just like all the other brain type uh, materials, we can find them bound within the myocardium. Okay? Now, these types are these are peptides created by the atria and ventricle. They have a potent a potential diuretic, nitritic, and vascular smooth muscle uh, relaxing activity. The levels of these oh, neurohormonal factors can be measured in blood, and their clinical usefulness of these are to detect a left ventricular dysfunction, particularly when there is stress, and can screening for uh, heart disease and uh, a differential diagnosis for dyspnea. Dyspnea can be of cardiac origin or of uh, pulmonary origin. Okay. Now this is an inflammatory marker. Okay, C-reactive protein is an acute phase uh, reactant that has been used as a marker of inflammation. Okay, and this marker of inflammation. The levels can be measured on the patients on admission, and it can be used to monitor the patients on treatment for acute myocardial infarction. Okay, so this is a marker that is only used to monitor, not to make a diagnosis. Now, these are the markers that are now recommended by WHO for uh, management of acute coronary syndrome or acute myocardial infarction. we routine now for routine diagnosis we use troponins so troponin has become the gold marker but we can also use CKMB. In retrospect retrospective uh, diagnosis as we said uh, markers that have a high a long half-life troponins are used okay skeletal muscle pathology we use troponins and troponins of skeletal origin and the urinary infarction we have CKMB, I told you that if an infarction occurs when you're about to discharge a patient, CKMB is the best marker. But you can also use myoglobin. Okay? Reperfusion, you can use myoglobin, troponins, and CKMB. And then for its assessment of infarct size, troponins are the best. Okay? The troponins are the prognosticating proteins. We use them as the concentration corresponds to the severity or the degree of injury. And risk stratification for in angina, in an unstable angina, we use troponins. And I have finished my talk. So what I'm going to is to give you a note that you're going to carry around to when you're going to the casualty. So this will help you identify which marker you're going to ask for on a patient that you have seen in car in your outpatient department. So this is giving you, this one is giving you uh, a simple outline of the markers that you can be you can be able to use when you identify your patients. This is for, you put this in your pocket and as you go to the emergency place, you may decide to use myoglobin to confirm your suspected diagnosis or use uh, aspartate transaminase, aminotransaminase 
to confirm your suspected diagnosis. So this is your guide, okay? And here are the markers that I have talked about in schematic form. And I've just given you a few of them to indicate where they appear in your uh, patient's history, okay? Patients who come very early, your myoglobin is the first one. Patients who come fairly late, lactate dehydrogenase is your enzyme of choice. The patients who come in the middle, then you can pick any of those enzymes to use, okay? So this is a schematic, whatever. And here are the books or the, the texts that enabled me to prepare this talk for you, okay? I have finished my talk, and now I'm sure you have numerous questions to ask. And as you have numerous questions to ask, I'll allow you to ask those questions. Now, here we are. Uh, I go to the... Oh, I had 30 students, eh? and here, a lot doc, there are some students who are uh, <laughs> wanting to be let in. Uh, is that a question? Ashil? Uh, no, 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 it's fine. Uh, you let them in. <laughs> oh, I let them in. Eh? Okay, so now I have, I'm expecting questions. So this chat should be full. Now, can we fill it so that I can be able to respond to your questions? Or you can talk. Yes, I mute and ask so that I can respond to you. Yeah, uh, Sandra Opio, how does homocysteine lead to? Uh, how does homocysteine lead to thrombotic events? I think this question you'll be asking the. <laughs> You'll be asking this to the, hello, Opio, Sandra. Hello? Hello, Sandra Opio, can you hear me? Oh, you don't want to respond verbally, <laughs> you want to write. Sandra, this question you should be asking the cardiologists. Huh? It's not my question, it's, your, it's a question you're going to keep, and next time you meet a cardiologist, you ask them. Yeah. You can't hear me? Hello, Sandra. All right, now you're gone. Gitao, could you explain could you, how CKMB is used to assess reinfarction? CKMB, hello, uh, Gitao, Wycliffe. Yes. Oh. Yeah, sorry, yeah, you can hear me, isn't it? Now, CKMB is a marker of acute myocardial infarction. It is used in the first three days of acute myocardial infarction. So anybody who comes to you within the first three days of acute myocardial infarction, you start from two to eight hours. Sorry, two to eight hours, you can be able to make a diagnosis. And all along, up to three days, you can be able to make a diagnosis. If this patient were admitted into your ward, Okay, you have made a cardiac myocardial infarction made based on CKMB. You have been managing them and you think they are well. And on the fourth day, before you discharge them, you you send blood for an assay of acute my oh sorry of uh, CKMB levels, and you find that the CKMB level is up or has risen. That means there is another uh, infarction event. That is a, re a reinfarction. Okay, are you answered? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, now, uh, do does, Doc, the, how can we differentiate AST elevation of cardiac or hepatic origin? Now, <laughs> that is a very technical question. Uh, cardiac origin and also AST of cardiac origin is not, it's not different from AST of uh, hepatic origin. It is the same enzyme activity. The only thing that will make us differentiate this from uh, the, that of hepatic origin is one, the clinical presentation is the first one. 
Okay. The second one is that we can also associate or call, uh, uh, couple AST levels with uh, electrocardiographic uh, uh, tracings. So if we have an electrocardiogram, which has AST ST segment elevation, and we have AST also elevated, the likelihood that AST is coming from the heart is high. Okay. But clinically, we can differentiate this because you are unlikely to have a liver sitting in your right left chest. Okay. Uh, one by the one, one boy. And yes, sir. yeah, did you get my answer? Uh, I'm done. Who's asked the other one for the percentile? Huh? One for the percentile. For the what? Percentile in the high sensitive troponin. The, there's a point you're talking about, the 99th percentile. Oh, oh, okay. Could you repeat the issue of the percentile you mentioned? Oh, no. oh okay. We have a range for normal, uh, normal levels, normal reference range for troponins. It is zero to two. Okay. In the normal in population, it is normally zero to two. 99th percentile is just slightly before the two mark on the uh, on uh, on the upper on the upper side of the reference range. It is that level at which we start measuring our troponins for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction using this high sensitive uh, cardiac troponin assay. Did you get that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now, Opio, uh, Sandra, why was renal disease classified under non uh, modifiable causes of AMI? Uh, it's not non modifiable causes, it's non modifiable predisposing factors of acute for acute myocardial infarction. A, acute renal disease is not a cause of cardiac disease. But the kidney is the main regulator of fluid volume. And when we have acute renal, acute or chronic renal failure, chances that we're going to have cardiac overload or fluid overload is very high. Okay, so myocardial infarction occurs when we give cardiac stress. And anytime we have volume overload, it is giving the myocardium stress. So the demand for the myocardium increases. So ischemia. It's not really uh, an ischemia due to an obstruction of the coronary vessels, but this ischemia is due to an increased demand, okay? And the kidney predisposes an individual to high volume, and that volume leads to an increased demand. Uh, Pio, Sandra, are you answered? Sandra. Oh, Pio Sandra, you didn't you didn't ask it. Eh? And uh, so we know, Michael. Hi Doc. You talked about now, I don't understand your question here. So... Uh, okay, I was wondering, is it uh, I was wondering it is it, it isn't under modifiable 